Hey, what's going on everyone? It's LJ. And this video is a response to a number of requests that I've gotten to show my Pink Floyd collection. I love Pink Floyd. Not one of my three favorite bands of all time, but I really do love them. Different periods more than others. So this video is really gonna be exactly what the title says. It's a review of my Pink Floyd vinyl collection. What do I own? What do I not? It's not in any way going to be a deep dive into detail about any one given album, the history, band tensions at the time, who was getting divorced or getting married at the time, the circumstances that surrounded the recordings of the albums, or anything like that. Every time I've filled a vinyl collection video, it seems like they quickly date themselves because either I find more things from that band or things get reissued as the interest in vinyl continues to surge. So at the time of filming this, Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, The Wall, and The Division Bell have all four been reissued on vinyl. So no other reissues have come out. So that said, kind of it's, it's a good baseline for the video. Do you know what's when you watch this a year from now? Oh, you don't have that reissue. Well, look at the video upload date, and there you go. Now let's jump into something Floyd vinyl. So I'll try my best in the beginning to run these in chronological order as best as I can. The very first period of Pink Floyd with Sid Barrett on the first and a bit on the second album and when David Gilmour joined the band um, for the second album. Now we're looking at 1967's Piper the Gates of Dawn and 1968's Saucer Full of Secrets. So the two, the way I have those two albums is on a nice pair. This still has the stickers front and back covering the uh, the nudity. I have a couple copies of this. The other copy has the stickers removed. So what I don't have is the individual releases of Piper at the Gates of Dawn and A Saucer Full of Secrets. And the reason for that is they're available in spades, especially with uh, different bootlegs and so forth. They are definitely out there. The reason I've not really hunted them down, to be honest with you, is I just really don't like those albums. That period of Pink Floyd just does very little, if anything, for me. This was released on the Harvest label. Sorry if you're getting any kind of a glare during this. They're not bad albums. Again, just for me personally, the Sid Barrett era of Pink Floyd and that early psychedelic era of Pink Floyd is just not a favorite. If I were to come across either one in really nice shape at a decent price, maybe I would scoop them up. But until then, I have both collected here. And to be honest with you, this is probably the album that I listen to the least in my Pink Floyd collection. Next up would have been 1969's Uma Guma. This is uh, one side, or two sides, one record, live recording, which would have been a partial set list at the time. And the other record is four individual contributions, one from each band member, which would have been, if I'm not mistaken, the fourth Pink Floyd album. After Piper at the Gates of Dawn, A Saucer Full of Secrets, and the soundtrack to More, or More. Uh, this is also on the Harvest labels. Now, no matter how many copies of this I find, I can never seem to find the one that has the, uh, the Gigi album cover down here, or movie poster, which has been removed. And again, it's an album that turns up fairly frequently, and I do have a couple copies of this as well. I always dug the album artwork, how it's a picture through a picture through a picture through a picture with just the band members changing places in between each one. Again, it's one that I just don't listen to that often simply because I just don't really dig that era of the band. Next up is 1970's Adam Hart Mother. I do like this album a lot. This is the first album that didn't feature a band name or pictures on the cover. That was later changed. Later issues of this album do say Pink Floyd or Adam Hart Mother in some variation on the front or the back. And it really is just a picture of a cow. Now it's said that this is an album that David Gilmour absolutely hates. This is on the Harvest label as well. I actually really like this album. I can't say I spin it a whole heck of a lot, but it has become really tricky to find. It's one many people wish would be reissued and it's not bad. I'm not exactly sure what David Gilmour's issue is with the album. I'm sure I could go read up on it. I just kind of like it. Next up is 1971's Relics. This was a stopgap release after the albums that I just showed you prior to and leading up to the next release, which would be Metal. 
And this is a collection of B-sides, rarities, stuff like that. Overall, it's, it's really kind of a for fans only album. I've often wondered, listening to this now, how this was received when it was first issued. Next up, also from 1971, as mentioned, here is Metal. Metal, very good album. This is a lot of people's favorite Pink Floyd albums. Uh, this is an ear underwater with the ripples indicating or attempting to replicate sound waves. Uh, this is an original first or early pressing. I'd really have to look at the dead wax and tell you for sure. So, there's the Harvest label. You know, we have this early original press and this is a later pressing. Uh, this one's a cutout as well. If you can imagine, even Pink Floyd wasn't safe from the deletion or cutout bins. And the biggest differentiator between the two is the color on this one is a little bit different than this one. But otherwise, they're entirely the same. And Metal is a, Metal's a really good album. It's most famous for Echoes, which takes up the entire side too. Uh, and it's a song that you can just listen to from any point in the song, and, and you'll recognize it whether you're a Floyd fan or not. It's uh, got a pretty, pretty widespread reaching reach. Pretty widespread reaching reach. Got it? <laughs> enrolled 1972 and enrolled Obscured by Clouds. The cover photo being one of a, an intentionally distorted picture of a man in a tree. It's the soundtrack to the film La Vallée. That was my best stab at French. Hope I didn't offend any French viewers out there. Uh, or the valley in English. I've never seen the movie and I very rarely spin the album. Much like Relics, right time, right place, right price, right condition. In the collection it goes. I honestly really can't even remember the album. It's been that long since I've listened to it. Dark Side of the Moon. One of the most wildly overrated albums Pink Floyd has ever released. Well, I just pissed off a legion of Pink Floyd fans. I didn't say it was a bad album. And what I mean by that is publications like Rolling Stone and video like MTV have hyped the album up to such a degree that we're all led to believe. Programs, how's that for a wall reference? That The Dark Side of the Moon is an amazing piece of work. So you really gotta listen through the whole Pink Floyd catalog and be familiar with music in general to really form an opinion, is it as good as it's built up to be? I do have a handful of pressings. Um, they all came with different things, poster, postcards, and so forth. Uh, this is an earlier pressing. This has a custom label on the vinyl. This is a later pressing, again with a deletion mark. And this has the rainbow capital label. Uh, this one I won't take out of the sleeve, but this is a MoFi pressing of this album. Uh, from Mobile Fidelity. This one just sounds absolutely amazing like any MoFi pressing should. And this is the reissue 2011, 2012. Uh, last couple of years, this is the reissue. Um, it doesn't sound any better or worse. I don't think any of the Pink Floyd reissues really did. They were just done well, but they're not like, wow, new life has been breathed into these albums. And that's a dark side of the moon. Again, you know, it's one that everybody really has been led to believe is this amazing, amazing, amazing work. And, and it was inventive at the time for its its work and the things that it did with multi-track recording and sequencers and, and it pushed the envelope there. But as far as how it stands in the rest of the catalog, it's just not, it's not this big shining diamond. Shine on you crazy diamond. Speaking of shining on you crazy diamond, here's an album that I think is infinitely better than Dark Side of the Moon. And that is 1975, Wish You Were Here. Uh, here's an earlier pressing. I don't believe it's an original first. It has a barcode on it. But definitely an album that you recognize right away from cover alone. And an album that focuses on the mental decline of Sid Barrett with the song Shine On You Crazy Diamond being a tribute to. Uh, here is the recent reissue. Was this 2011, 2012? Came out the same time as Dark Side of the Moon did. Uh, and it's in this bag, black bag. And again, like Dark Side of the Moon, it doesn't necessarily blow the original away. Just sounds really good. Here's where my real obsession with Pink Floyd kicks in. 1977's Animals. This is where there was a real, real turn, a change in Pink Floyd. It's terrifyingly easy to hear what would become the wall forming here. This is just an amazing, 
dark and brooding album with huge amounts of history about the cover, the music, the state of the band, tensions, the writing process, and so forth that you can go look up online. But what I'll show you here is two copies. Uh, besides slight color variations, this one simply has no barcode. It's an earlier pressing, and this one is a later pressing with a barcode on it. Animals has definitely become an underdog fan favorite from everyone that I've talked to over the years, and it's an absolutely brilliant album. I would take Animals over Dark Side of the Moon seven days a week. Nineteen seventy nine, my gateway drug into Pink Floyd, a forever favorite and one of the ten favorite albums in my entire record collection, hands down. Pink Floyd's The Wall. I have three different pressings of it. This is an earlier one. They all have the same label, so I'll go ahead and show you one. This is the inner sleeve to the wall. So around 1985, 86 or so, I was nine or 10 years old, and I saw the movie The Wall at a friend's house. We had been out riding dirt bikes and four wheelers all day and decided to spend the night. He was a little older, he had a VCR in his room, and he popped on The Wall. Blew my mind absolutely blew my mind and this is the recent reissue as well that has it as part of the cover it doesn't come off um and this is on 180 gram vinyl so anyway watching the movie that night made an instant pink floyd fan out of me i was just absolutely blown away i had no idea what i had just seen or what i was getting myself into it took me no time after that to go ahead rush right out and pick up a copy of the album that had inspired that movie the soundtrack that's playing in the background the shirt on my chest and what would become one of my favorite albums ever this has a massive fold-out poster in it the wall is simply brilliant pink floyd's masterwork an amazing album Nineteen eighty one gave us kind of an odd album, a collection of great dance songs. This is mostly more interesting than anything for well not being dance songs. Yeah, that's interesting. No, it's most interesting for the edited version of Shine On You Crazy Diamond and the re-recorded version of Money. Otherwise this album has absolutely no purpose. Now this was a cool find. This is 1982's The Wall, the film, the soundtrack. I've seen a lot of different cover variations and vinyl variations of this over the years. In a nutshell, it's the soundtrack to the film. It has songs that were in the film or things from the film that weren't on The Wall, the album. But you have to remember that The Wall, the album came before The Wall, the movie. And this has things like The Little Boy That Santa Claus Forgot or uh, When the Tigers Broke Free. Things that were released uh, as singles or B-sides, rarity but not necessarily as part of the Wall of the Album. So what seems to me to have been, in my research, the most controversial fact of this particular album, and it doesn't show up very often. Actually, it's the only one that I've ever seen, and despite a crease in the corner, I grabbed it fast. It's just my infatuation with the Wall, uh, is what is the audio source? And you really can't tell. Some people believe it's a VHS, it's a laser disc. I, all I can say is it sounds fantastic, and this one is fun to pull out and spin. I just love it. Nineteen eighty three gave Pink Floyd fans the final album with Roger Waters, the final cut. Said to be mostly about personal experiences from Roger's childhood with his father at war. Uh, this is one seriously, seriously dark, depressing, not fun to listen to album. This isn't going to do anything to start your Monday off right, boost your energy levels, or get you to get a better time on the mile run but it is a piece of Pink Floyd's catalog. It's not a bad album at all. You just gotta be real careful with your headspace when you listen to that one. The next, 1987, another personal favorite in the Pink Floyd catalog, and it's most likely due to timing. 1987, remember I told you I got hooked on the wall in 85, 86, so I couldn't wait for another album to come out. And the next one out was this, Momentary Lapse of Reason. Bob Ezrin back producing as he did on The Wall in about a hundred other legendary albums from the 70s and 80s. Three or four original members of Pink Floyd. Roger Waters is gone at this point, and I think this album is brilliant. I love every, every single note of this album. Easily one of my favorite Pink Floyd albums in their entire catalog, and one I spin ridiculously frequently. This probably comes out 
at least once every couple of weeks and hits the turntable. I just know it note for note. It was in my jacket and my Walkman for years. It's a fantastic album. Now, the Momentary Lapse of Reason Tour was recorded for 1988's The Delicate Sound of Thunder. The Delicate Sound of Thunder is an absolutely beautiful, amazing, brilliant live album. This was recorded, I believe, in New York over five nights, right towards the end of that show. This is an album that has many Pink Floyd vinyl fans begging for a reissue of. And I don't disagree because I was shocked to find how expensive it's become over the years. I can say this though, if you're thinking about it, just pull the trigger on it if you can because it's an absolutely amazing album. It sounds phenomenal. It's got an amazing set list and it's from just an absolutely amazing tour. Outstanding release. Now here's an album from 1994 whose tour grossed about a hundred million dollars. Bob Ezrin back in the driver's seat again for The Division Bell. The Division Bell is a really, really good album. Um, it was never a hardcore favorite of mine. There's definitely some really good tracks on it. I absolutely love The Wall and Momentary Lapse of Reason and Delicate Sound of Thunder all ahead of The Division Bell. But this was extremely limited. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, it's been reissued. But for years, 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 this was one of the most sought after pieces of Pink Floyd vinyl next to original copies of Piper at the Gates of Dawn. And this is an original first press. Uh, if you followed my channel for a long time, you'll know that I walked into this uh, a year or two ago, two years ago, for $10. Uh, the only way to tell a true original is that there is TML-M stamped in the dead wax because it's also one of the most counterfeited albums out there. But again, it's been reissued, new ones are out there, and it also gave way to a tour and live release of its own. And that is Pulse. And here is Pulse. I don't have Pulse on vinyl. Pulse on vinyl is ridiculously expensive. So a lot like Delicate Sound of Thunder, it's a live recording, this time from the tour for the Division Bell. Um, Pulse is pretty cool. Here's the tricky part, is to find a copy of Pulse that still has the red blinking light. The Pulse, the Pulse, the Pulse. It's a two CD set, and it has a hardbound book inside. Again, like Delicate Sound of Thunder, it's brilliantly recorded. Uh, it's a really good set list, but you know what's just different about, you put the needle, the needle down on a record on Delicate Sound of Thunder and the sonics just blow you away, just wow. That's what you expect when you put a CD in, because CDs just sound good, right? Whatever, no, digital. But there's something really cool about setting the needle down on a record and just being floored. I'm not saying Pulse is bad, but I think Delicate Sound of Thunder is just a little bit better. If you have a comment, feel free to leave it below. But that is my Pink Floyd vinyl collection. Thanks for checking it out. Hope you dug it and maybe even learned something.